Bible uh, this morning, I would ask you just to remain seated. It's a uh, longer reading than normal. I was a little bit worked up this morning knowing that we were going to read a whole chapter. And I thought, well, this is God's Word. I said, this is God's Word. And you are in church. And it is okay to read it. Genesis chapter 12, verse 8, and we'll read all the way through chapter 13, which will be our foundation this morning. How to arrive at God's destination for your life. This is part 7. Part 7, and eventually part 70. No. If you're visiting with us, there'll be enough in here. I am sure that God uh, will uh, minister to you, so don't feel left out. We have the CDs over there as well, if, uh, if uh, you so desire. Genesis chapter 12, verse 8, and I'll be reading out of the King James Version. Tell me if you have it. Yes. I need a big amen. amen. And Abram removed or traveled... Uh, unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent from Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed still for, uh, toward the south. And there was a famine in the land and Abram did what, beloved? I need you to come with me. What did he do? He went up to Egypt. What's your Bible say? He went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine, notice, was very grievous, King James says, in the land. And it came to pass, when he had come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto his wife, Sarai, Behold now, you are a beautiful woman to look upon, and it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians see you, they shall say uh, that this is uh, I am your husband, and they will kill me, but they will s save you alive. So uh, I would ask you and pray that you would tell them that uh, I am your, uh, you are my sister, that it may be well with me for uh, your sake, and my soul shall live because of you. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the, Egypt, the Egyptians beheld uh, Sarai that she was very beautiful, verse 15. And all of the leaders of, of, and Pharaoh also that saw her commended her before Pharaoh, and Sarai was taken into Pharaoh's house. Verse 16, and he entreated Abram well for her sake, and gave him sheep, oxen, donkeys, maid servants, men servants, and camels. Verse 17, and the Lord plagued Pharaoh uh, and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done unto me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Uh, why did you say she is my sister? Then I, I might have taken her to be my wife. Now, therefore, behold, this is your wife. Take her and go on your way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, his wife and all that he had. Chapter 13, verse 1. And Abram did what? One more time, did what? He went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him unto the south, and Abram was very rich in cattle, silver and gold. And we, he went on his journey from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and Abram called on the name of the Lord. In verse 5, and Lot also went with Abram, and he had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was so great that they could not dwell together. Verse 7, and King James says, And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanites and Perizzites and Mosquitoites also dwelt there. Verse 8, And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be what? One more time, verse 8, Let there be what? No strife, I pray, between me and you and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are related. We are brothers. Is this not the whole land before us? 
separate yourself, Abram said, I pray, from me. And if you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if you depart to the right, then I will do what? I will go to the left. And Lot, verse 10, lifted up his eyes and beheld all of the plain of the Jordan, that it was very well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. For it was as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, like Zoar, verse 11, and Lot chose him. King James says, all of the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and there they separated themselves one from another. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent where? Verse 12, where? Towards Sodom, verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes. Look from the place where you are, north, south, east, and west. For all of the land which you see, I will what? I will give it to you and of your inheritance or seed forever. Verse 16. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. And no man will be able to number the dust of the earth. So shall your seed be numbered. Verse 17. Now arise, walk through the land and length of it in the breadth of it. And I will give it unto you. Verse 18. And then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt at the mighty oaks of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. And I'll just read to you one more scripture just to uh, tighten this up a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 6. Paul, talking about the Old Testament situations of a promised land, he said, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant... Ignorant literally means one who lacks knowledge. I don't want you to lack knowledge that how all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all did eat the same spiritual meat or food and all did drink of that spiritual rock for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Jesus Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were for our examples, so that we don't do likewise. Okay, now would you mind standing and we'll pray together. Can't have you sleeping so early. Father, I again am so uh, grateful for the opportunity to share your holy living word. I am reminded, O oh God, of the beautiful blood of martyrs that were spilled for this holy word. I'm reminded, O oh God, of even the priest Ezra when he opened it up during the rebuilding of your temple that all of the people stood in deep honor stood and worshipped you and bowed down through the mighty majesty of your holy word. And I pray, O oh God, that you would continue to use your word to change me and to change us. Continue to be so grace-filled that you would call us into a destination that you have for each one of us, that we might declare that you're a glorious, magnificent, wonderful God. I thank you, O oh God, in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How to arrive at God's destination for your life. I'm going to say this until this series is over or until we're all raptured. God has a destination for your life. I need to have a good amen. amen. I said God has a destination for your life. Amen. Don't look at where you are. Look at where God is going to take you. Amen. Don't be anchored into your history. Trust that God has a destiny for your life. He told Israel one of the reasons why you couldn't come into the uh, promised land is that you did not consider your destiny. 
And God wants to bring every single one of us into a promised land that he has for you. He has a promised land for you spiritually. He wants you and I to grow spiritually. He has a promised land for healing of every sick body. He has a promised land for your occupation, vocation, and for your finance. He has a promised land for your marriage, for your family, for your single life, and for your future. We've mentioned, though, this destination that he has for you and I isn't going to happen by accident. You're not going to fall into a promised land or a destination that he has for you. It's not going to happen even though it's God's will to get you there. You've already been taught that many things happen that aren't God's will. We read in 1 Corinthians 10 where two and a half million people, God wanting to bring them into a promised land, but many were destroyed in the wilderness. They drank from the spiritual rock, which was Christ. They ate from the manna, which was food from heaven for them. And yet they did not enter into their promised land. I ask you today, beloved saints and those watching uh, from afar, does God have a destination for you? Does God want to bring you into that destination? If you and I follow the keys of Abram, Abraham, you and I have the greatest possibility of God bringing you into that promised land. Well, why Abram? Why him? The Bible calls him in Romans 4.11. He is the father of your faith. He is the father of those who believe. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, when Israel began to stray, Isaiah 51, 1 through 2, the prophet came to them and he said, Now hearken, hearken unto me, for God says unto you, Go back to the rock from which you were hewn. Go back to the rock from which you were hewn. Look unto Abraham, your father. For I called him and blessed him and increased him. That in this model of a father, Abram, there are keys. For he got into the promised land. And through these keys that we find in his life, I am assured that God is going to get you, your family, your children, your loved ones, into the promised land he has for your life too. If you believe that, could you give the Lord a shout and an amen. Today, my hope is just to recap some of the keys of the last six hours. I'm not going to try to touch them. I'm just going to mention them. And my heart for you is that once I mention some of the keys that we've already uh, have seen in the life of Abram, that if those are in you, you just put a little check in your heart. I got that. I have that key. I, I, I'm, I'm there with that. And if not, I would encourage you to grab the CDs and begin to install Automobile University. Yeah. Second thing I want to endeavor to do today uh, is I, I, I want to make sure you and I uh, react uh, when there's a famine in your land. You're, you're not going to get to the promised land without having to react properly to a famine in your land. And I want to make sure you and I uh, choose well during that time. Number three, I want to just spend a few minutes on family tensions, how to deal with family tensions. That should bring a good amen. Number four, uh, we'll touch on the six cities of refuge. That's important to know. Number five, somewhere in there, the slow steps leading to backsliding. The slow steps that lead to backsliding. And then how vision begins. So let's, let's begin now in terms of some of the keys we've already discovered. And I'm not going to uh, uh, push into those. We've already covered them. But we've learned key number one, that uh, uh, having a revelation from God is paramount. We've mentioned Acts 7, 23, that the uh, God of glory appeared to Abraham. And the cry for you as a Christian and I is that God would re continue to release a revelation of himself. With each and every revelation of who he is, it calls you and I to build an altar. It calls you and I to greater sacrifice to him. 
every time God would reveal himself to Abram, Abram would build an altar. There would be greater levels of sacrifice unto God concerning his life before him. Often I could look at Christians' lives to see what kind of sacrifice is happening in terms of their life before him. It tells me most often what kind of revelation they have had in terms of their walk before God. Number uh, two. See how slow I am today? Two is uh, separation. Uh, separation. He told Abram, come out of your country, come out of your kindred, come out of your father's house. We taught on ethnicity, class, and familiarity, and underlined the fact of Exodus eleven seven. 7. God said that I have put a line of separation on my people that are not a line on those that aren't my people. That God has separated you by His Spirit, not by circumcision of men's hands, but by His Holy Spirit, He has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. It is a spiritual work that God has done inside of your life, and it's difficult to explain that to other people. But he says, there has been a mark, a tav, that I have put on you that isn't on another person, uh, a people that aren't saved. And this world and the enemy wants to blur lines. And now we seem to not know who's male and who's female. We seem to have confusion about a, a host of things. Again, God has separated. He has put a line, boundaries, bloodlines, and timelines within the elect of God. Amen. Number three, we need to remove delays. It wasn't until Abraham saw the passing away of Terah, his father, which meant delay. Before you and I get into the promised land, you're going to have to make sure areas that are causing you delay, they must come to an end in your life. We gave you a host of examples of what delays might mean. We shared with you a key scripture, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, see how well I taught that? Above all else, guard your heart, for out of it what? Flows the issues of life. One of the causes of delays are that issues came into my heart. And he wants to make sure that in the course of human life, you don't allow the issues to come in. He says, guard your heart, for issues shouldn't be coming out. They should have never been brought in. Number four, you have learned that we serve a God of not just a second chance, but what? God of another chance, and another chance, and another chance. That should make someone grab and shout and run around this campus because God has given you and I so many chances. Man has said, I'm not giving you any more. The judge says you're not getting any more chances, but you have a greater judge, and it is the judge of the living and the dead. And he says, I am a God of another chance, another chance, another chance, another chance, and another chance. I'm grateful for a God of another chance in my life. He told Abram, look, you've wasted so much time. You haven't separated yourself. You got to wrong. It cost you 15 years of your life. And he says, again, I call you Abram and release to him his de decree of destination. You serve a God of another chance and another chance and another chance. Key number five is that you learned about the three types of righteousness. Abram, the Bible says he went to Shechem, a place of strength, the Hebrew is. And he, he sat underneath an oak tree, which we've shared with you scripturally, that speaks of righteousness. And he was at a region called Marah, which meant teaching. God was teaching Abram about righteousness and how that can be a strength to his life. A strength to his life. We didn't take time, but there were probably 60 scriptures showing that the great oak tree is, is symbolic of righteousness. When God was viewing Gideon's life, he sat as a, as a uh, um, theophany, 
uh, as God as a spirit, he clothed himself as an angel and he sat under an oak tree depicting righteousness. And he viewed Gideon's life and he sat there and he watched him. And, and you know, God watches you, beloved. He isn't just watching you on Sunday. He watches you and I everywhere you go. He, he just was watching Gideon and he says, oh, man of great strength. And continued to declare to him who he was. Even though Gideon fought back against it, God says, I call things that are not as though they were. God loves you. God is with you. God is for you. And he releases the righteousness of Jesus Christ unto you. Number six, you learned about the laws of the altar. That almost every prominent uh, figure within your Bible, they learned how to build an altar. And so the, uh, uh, the inquisition for you and I was, do you have an altar in your life? Is there a, a place where you can encounter him and, and when the Spirit of God and the Word of God is moving on you, what do you do with that? Abraham is a man of the altar and we shared with you the three laws of the altar, which I won't go over uh, here. Since we've gone over them, you'll have to get it. Number seven, we've learned how to manage painful transitions. Uh, the Bible says that Abram found himself in the middle uh, between Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. Uh, Ai, hey, I got lunch here. Who's awake? What did Ai mean? Very good. Place of ruins. Would you give Rashid, my man on the drums today, a shout of an amen? Some of you are new here and you think, well, all they want is money. I give away more money in this church than I get. <laughs> he was caught in the place of transitions. Bethel means house of God. Ai means place of ruins. And so what the keys Abram was teaching us is that some of us are coming out of a place of ruins... You're coming out of a divorce. You're coming out of a broken relationship. You're coming out of bankruptcy. You're coming out of heartache. You're coming out of loneliness. And you're not all the way to Bethel yet. You're not all the way where he would have you. You're right in the middle. And Abram was encouraging you and I that God promises to get you out of the place of ruins and get you into the place of the palace if you follow his ways and follow his principles. Say this with me. I'm coming out. Say it with me, I'm coming out. You're going to come out of that job loss. You're going to come out of that marriage problem. You're going to come out of those things that have caused ruins in your life because God has a destination for you. We've learned that Abram was a man of the tent. That's number eight if you're counting. The Bible says he pitched his tent between Ai and Bethel and built an altar unto God. And we mentioned last week that the tent speaks of uh, growth. It speaks of change. It speaks of progression. And I posed the question primarily for me, asking you if you're growing spiritually, asking you if there is uh, any indication in your life that you're growing spiritually. Abram was the man of a tent. He's speaking, hey, I'm endeavoring to grow spiritually in my life. He was called out of his father's house, a, a place of stability, a place of uh, security. And now the Bible says in uh, uh, Hebrews 11, 9, by faith, Abram sojourned, not wandered, sojourned, looking for uh, a, a country, dwelling in tents. For he was looking with, for a city with foundations whose builder and architect is God. So I asked uh, the question because this is probably one of a handful of the most painful things for me in terms of this post or position. Is are God's people growing? Are you growing? And I run through the Rolodex of your life often most often during the course of an end of a year to go, is she growing? Is he growing? 
And uh, I evaluate what I'm teaching, how I teach, and why I'm not able to reach this person, and yet this person is growing. And so I guess I take a lot of responsibility for your growth. I don't take all of the responsibility because you are a priest. And you are to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The law of the altar was that the priest was supposed to put wood on that altar to keep it burning all through the night and all through the day. I can't do that daily for me, and I can do it for me, but not for you. And so there's a lot uh, that goes into this. So let me ask you, since we're here, are you growing? Yes. You're not convincing me. Are you growing? Yes. I want to make sure you're growing in God. Why? Because the Bible is pretty strong in terms of this position where God says you are responsible for that flock. That if you don't share with them the totality of this word, there'll be blood upon your forehead and you will be held accountable. So I don't take this as an occupation. This is not an occupation that I would pick. I need a good amen. Amen. This is not an occupation I would pick. It is a calling. You may not know this, but I hate getting up in front of people. I get diarrhea. So after I get up and have coffee, you know what happens. I almost throw up every single time. Almost 30 years of doing this. Tina knows if she has a birthday party for me and invites anybody, that we are in divorce court at least for a day. (laughs) Why? Because I don't want that attention. I don't want to be that. I don't like that. And the only way for me is to pray where I'm able to stand up. Are you growing? Hey! Your... Life before God. One of the uh, sermonettes I was going to do basically is that all are all stars equal in eternity? Uh, Are all Christians going to be equal? Not going to be equal. How you manage your day to day life here on earth towards God is going to determine your eternal position forever and ever and ever. That there is going to be a millennium for a thousand years and you will be on the earth. There is a new heavens and a new earth coming for you. And if you don't understand the end game, then you're going to, the Bible says, some will suffer loss. And so my heart is to present to you the full counsel of God so you could make your day-to-day choices like me and that you and I can endeavor to hold on to him and come across the finish line where he can declare you are a five-star general in the world to come. Turn to someone and tell them, no buck privates in here. Tell them, no buck privates in here. We're raising up generals. I said, we're raising up generals. I said, we're raising up generals in here. Jeremiah 48, 11, spending too much time on this, but I know you give me extra play. Jeremiah said, hey, uh, Moab, you've been at ease from your youth, and you've settled on your lees, and you've not been emptied from bottle to bottle, Neither have you had any warfare. Therefore, your spiritual taste has remained the same. And your spiritual fragrance has not changed. You know, I have people in here that have come. They have been in church, one couple in here. They were in church 43 years and never prayed for anybody. Never prayed for a soul. So their first week in here, I said, come pray. I don't know how. I said, just lay your hands on and let the Holy Spirit come out of you and just rat-tat-tat on somebody. (laughs) And so he was declaring there was no tent life. There was no growth. There was no no, uh, progression in his Christian life. What a sad, sad documentary 
that you have people in church 40 and 50 years and there's no spiritual growth, that you're still, this person is still a little baby, and God wants to mature you and I and grow you and I where you become a threat to the devil, you become armed and dangerous to the devil. I know your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, but again, we want the devil to know your name. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But he said to the uh, sons of the priests, but who are you? That there was no spiritual rank or measure of rule where they, they, they understood uh, authority, spiritual authority. I'm here to raise the bar and call men and women to the life of a tent where you and I are committed to grow and become everything God wants you to become. Now we're here, new ground. You made it. You have all, all uh, eight keys. Turn to someone and say, I got all those eight keys now. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> what do you do when you're in a famine? How do you manage a famine in your life? Not so much of food. A famine of companionship. A famine in relationship. A famine in sensitivity from your spouse. They just don't get me. They just don't, they just don't feel me. A famine in your finance. A famine in hope. A famine in vision and direction. A famine in dreams being realized. A famine in God's spirit. A famine of relational loss. How do you manage famine in your life? You're not going to get to the promised land without managing a famine well. Abram, the father of our faith, I so love this because he was filled with uh, stumblings. He was filled with um, you know, pitfalls and, and uh, things that would happen to him. So it brings me encouragement, not because of his perfection, but because of his weakness. Because of his weakness. And so here he had, the Bible called it a grievous famine. A grievous famine. Now, are you going to go through a famine of some sorts? Yes. How you and I manage the famine is key. One, never make a decision in your dark place. Amen. Say this with me. I will never make a decision in a dark place. May God sear that in your heart that you must let the famine clear away, the clouds blow away before you make any choices. Number two, let me ask you in your reading, where did Abram go? He didn't go to uh, Austin. Where did he go? He went down to Egypt. If you've been in this but, uh, church for any length of time, what does Egypt symbolize? The world system. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. Satan has blinded their eyes, deadened their ears so that they might not see nor hear nor turn to me, saith the Lord. This world system is governed by the God of this world and his name is Lucifer. His name is Satan. He is the king of darkness and he endeavors to use the world system to progressively bring humanity into the fiery abyss for eternity and eternity and eternity. If you come through a famine and you're in a famine where there is something you want that is missing. Where do you go? Abram went down to the world, down to Egypt. That isn't where you want to go. God instructs you and I in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1. Woe to those that go down to Egypt for help, who rely on the strength of their horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and their great strength. He says, but do not look, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel and seek help from me, says the Lord. 
Isaiah 30, verse 2. Who will go down to Egypt without consulting me, the Lord thy God? Who will look uh, to Pharaoh for protection and to Egypt for shade and for refuge? Here, Abram, he went down to Egypt and there was tremendous consequences. Tremendous consequences. Say this with me. No Egypt. He had consequences. And the, and the sad resume, this not only happened one time to him, it happened twice. And not only did it happen twice to him, Isaac, his son, did the very same thing in his famine. Beloved parent and grandparent and, and Christian, how you choose to react to your famine is going to have an effect on people whether you realize it or not. Whether you realize it or not. The Bible says no man or woman lives or dies to himself. He went down to Egypt and now because he was yoked with Sarai, now Pharaoh began to go ahead and almost began to make love and intimacy with Abram's wife. Now I have a good uh, uh, encouragement for some that have found themselves in a mess because of what someone else has done and you're yoked to them. Some of the most painful trials to come through isn't necessarily what you did. It's what someone else did that caused you great heartache and great pain. And now you're in this place of heartache, pain, brokenness like Sarai. So here she is, married to Abram. And he says, basically, can you just do a little life for me? I'm, I'm worried about my own life. You know, she put on that Dead Sea mask. And here she was like 85, you know, no wrinkles. You know, just looking. She was a knockout in Palestine. And so now, consequently, she found herself in a, in, a, in, a, in a broken place, a wounded place, not because of what she did, but because of what Abram did. Yeah. Now, if, you, if that's you today, and someone has betrayed you on a relationship, and, and did this to you, and did that to you, and, and here you are having to pick the pieces up. You see, that's some of the, the counseling heartache is that you weep with people that have had tremendous bludgeoning that's happened to them, not because of their own choices, but the choices of other people. And then they say, now where's God? I want to declare that God will be faithful to you. That even though Abram, he messed up on this one, who protected Sarai? God said, hey, if no one else comes in and cleans this mess up, I am your God. I'll come in and I'll rescue you out of this mess and I'll get you out where there's no harm to your life. Someone shout, no harm. No. Say it, no harm. no harm. God will help you and bring you and support you and strengthen you and declare that you are a victor with him. There's a refuge. It isn't in Egypt. Quickly, let me just share this with you. There is six uh, cities of refuge. I'll just give them and get out of the way on this area. But people would go and try to find a refuge. I was listening uh, this week to, I could never pronounce his name. It's not Kane West, it's what? Kanye. Kanye, okay. And so he was going through how he became truly born again. And he was talking about all of the millions of dollars and all of the jets and the lifestyle and the sex and the money and, and what Egypt has to offer. And he said he got so full of it. He just ate it till it was running out of his nose. And he says, you know what? That was when God broke into his life and said, all of these areas, they're not a refuge for you. They're destroying you. And he had an encounter, a revelation of Jesus Christ into his life where now he bowed his knee and at least to this day declares Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of his life. Now I've already been told by someone in the know that that, uh, that uh, commitment of his is already touching down on some pretty high big fish in Hollywood. 
And so we continue to lift him up and pray for him that God would support him in that declaration. Six cities, are you ready? Real quick. Jude, uh, excuse me, it's in Joshua 20 and Numbers 35. Egypt is in a refuge that, uh, that that alarm's a refuge. People wonder, what's that alarm mean? What meaneth that? That, mean, that meaneth 30 more minutes. Did that drag or did that go okay? You're a good Christian. <laughs> Let me give you quick six, six refuges. Now, if, if you want more of this, we did a message a couple of years ago t entitled The Manslayer and His Refuge. Yeah, the Manslayer and His Refuge. I'm just going to give these to you. And uh, they're found in uh, Joshua 20 and Numbers 35. The first place of God's refuge is called Kadesh. And it's a refuge for the unclean. The Hebrew literally means Kadesh, a holy place. And so there was a refuge for the unclean. The second city of refuge is called Hebron. It literally means in the Hebrew fellowship. It's a refuge for the lonely, for the homeless. The third refuge is called Bezer. It means a stronghold. It is a refuge for the helpless. The fourth city of refuge is called Ramoth. It means exalted. It's a refuge for the hopeless. The fifth city of refuge is called Golan. It means to be separated. It's a refuge for the tempted and for the worldly. And lastly, number six, the sixth city, Shechem, it means strength. It's a refuge for the weak. Now all of these cities symbolize really found in Jesus Christ. He is your rock. He is your refuge. He is the place you and I go to when I'm in a dark place. So kiss and tell 30 something years ago, uh, Tina and I, I received divorce papers. Turn to someone and say, what the? That's a pretty dark day. You know, we can talk about it, but when you go through some of those things, you go through some of those things. You have choices to make. Guess who calls? My ex-girlfriend. One day after I got some divorce papers. Hello? Debbie Samolin? What timing? Turn to someone and tell them the devil knows how to time things. Can I have a good witness? I haven't talked to her in like 30 years. All of a sudden she called, how'd you get my number? Oh, from such and such and such and such. Hey, do you want to meet at the mall? Such and such and such and such. Now I'm, 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 in, a, I'm in a famine. I'm bleeding everywhere. And now she calls. Don't you know what I did? You have to come back next week. <laughs> That's how the days of our lives continues for like 90 years. They just, they just keep that out there and you're like, well, I got to see what happened to Sarah. I mean, what happened with Abram? I got to come back and find out what happened to her. 90 years later, it's still the same stuff, right? I tell you all of that for you to make sure that when there is something that's taken from you or something that's missing that you want, you and I need to run to the refuge, Jesus Christ. Lay your soul out to him. Cry to him. Weep to him. Allow him to be all he is for your life. <sighs> Almost finished here. Bible says in Genesis 13, 1 through 4, that after those lessons, Abram went up from Egypt. And God brought him to the very place. It says here, he went from place to place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, where he had first built an altar. Now, if God is after something in, who's still listening? If he's after something in your life, 
Let's say there's unforgiveness. Okay. Someone's mad at Frank in here or wherever, and now you won't forgive Frank. And so now you're tired of looking at Frank, and so now you leave. I'm sick of looking at Frank. He did this, this happened, and I'm going to leave. Well, you should know now the principle is this, that if God is after something, he brought Abram back to the very place that he got off the straight and narrow path. So all of that time in Egypt, all of those things that happened, God says, no, I want to deal with that issue in you. I'm going to bring you, go, go from place to place, go from first Baptist, second Baptist, third Baptist, fourth Baptist, fifth Baptist, sixth Baptist, seventh Baptist, and I'm going to bring you all the way back because this is what I want out of you. I want you to learn to forgive. One old worldly song, I shouldn't tell you, 50 years ago was, uh, I think it was Diana Ross or Aretha Franklin. I'm not saying, young people, you listen to that. She said, who's zooming who? You're like, what's that mean? You see, if you're old like me, you know what that means. That means who's fooling who? You're going to fool God? You're going to think he doesn't care about you and he's going to let you go from place to place to place to place to place and not deal with the issue? You will deal with the issue whether how much time you want to take with it. He'll bring you all the way back to Second Baptist, Fifth Baptist, Four Winds and say, now let's clean up your stuff. I got no amens on that. I rocked the box on that point and I got no amens on that. Did you hear that point? Yes. Amen. So if you don't and I don't let God do the deeper work, you're going to go from place to place to place to place, and you're going to point all of the reasons why. And let me tell you, principally, what's going to happen? Come on, what's going to happen? He's going to bring you right back to where you were at first and say, now let's pull the root out and get things cleaned up because I love you enough to not let you get away with it. Marquez, I just rocked the box on that. I got nothing for that. I got nothing for that. Hmm. All the new people are like, my God, is it over? <laughs> this clock didn't turn over. Turn to someone and say, we got a whole another hour. It's 10 to 11. Someone shout, hallelujah. You know, all the church strategies. Okay, never do longer than three messages in a series. It bores the people. Point two, make sure you no go longer than 20 minutes on your sermon. That's why we don't have 5,000 here. Point three, make sure worship only goes 13 minutes. I'm like, wow. We got to reduce it all the way down to that? For what? Church growth? Offerings? What? I'm here to declare to you, we don't roll that way up in here. I'm here to declare to you that if you can sit four hours for the Astros, you better get your butt trained that it can sit four hours for the holy word of Jesus Christ. If you can shout hallelujah for uh, Altuve, you can shout louder for hallelujah Jesus. Rocking the box right up in there. Let's quick, I got to get this out and then I'm done. Here we go. How do you deal with family tensions? So now Abram, oh, this big right up in here. This is going to get hot right here. You are happy with me until this. So now Abram and Lot. Remember, God called Abram and Sarai. He didn't call his pop. He didn't call Terah his father. He didn't call his nephew Lot. So now Abram in the destination dragged around delay. And he dragged around Lot. Lot means to veil the vision. Lot means to, to pollute the vision. 
So now, Delay's finally out of his life. He lost 15 years. But he's got his nephew, Lot, that, is, that has veiled his vision. And so now, they have been living together, trying to journey together, and now there's conflict between family. Mm. You know the problem with the gospel, if I can say that? Is that we actually have to live it. So I read this. I've had more family problems in the last year than I've had in the previous 30. Can I have a witness? Your family's doing good? Lay hands on me. Watch the wax. I'm getting silly now. May this be a comfort. The Bible is replete and filled with family tensions. Moses fighting with his sissy. Miriam fighting with his brother Aaron. Going John with each other. Jacob fighting with his kids. Kids fighting with Jacob. Now we got Abram. Him and his nephew carrying on. He said, now look, there's strife happening. There's strife happening. So Abram says, now Abram is the pioneer. Abram is the, uh, is the, uh, the master. He is, the, uh, he is the, uh, um, his rank and measure of rule. Please listen to this. Was much higher than his nephew Lot. Now watch how this played out. So he says, there's so much strife in here. Abram wanted peace in his home. In your family. Now, we're not going to be able to dig all of this out. There's too many situations. But there should be a, a desire to have a refuge of peace. That's why the devil wants unrest and division and strife and all of that in marriages and in families. And so Abram's like, look, we've tried to work this thing out. But there's so much strife. There's no peace when I come home. It's hell out here. I need a refuge of just peace so there's no fighting. No fighting. So he said, now I'm not suggesting this for you. I'm telling you what he did. He said, let's separate. Let's separate ourselves for a while. Let's get this cleaned and clean the air out a little bit. I pause to say divorce, that bullet is always in your gun, but that's the last bullet that should be pulled. I separate people and say, look, let him live without you. Let him feel that without you. Maybe that'll make him wake up and go, what did I just lose? Now, I'm not saying it's always the guy, but a lot of times it's the guy. <laughs> I should have a big amen from the women. Now, I love you, Pastor Steve. I, uh, I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> Someone shout peace. peace. Blessed are the... Peace. Matthew 5, 9. James 3, 17. Watch. Wisdom from above is first. Listen. Pure. Wisdom from above is first pure. And then peaceable. Gentle. Watch this. Easy to be entreated. Why am I afraid to talk to you? Because there's going to be this explosion that comes out of you. Why is it, what am I, what am I, what root am I touching? He said, let's part company. Let's part company. I'll pause and ask you in terms of this, what's veiling your vision? You got a lot with you that needs to like separate. You have a poor self-image about yourself. Are you believing lies about yourself? That's going to taint your vision. You're made in the image of God. I said you're made in the image of God. Is there fear? But the past. Those are lots. They need to be separated in your life. He says, okay, let's part company. Watch this now. Here we are. The Bible says that Lot lifted up his eyes. He lifted up his eyes. The Bible says he saw and beheld this area 
likened unto the Jordan, well watered. That word saw or beheld literally was the Hebrew raha, and it meant to fantasize and to be filled with delusion. And then he says he chose for himself. He didn't even consult Abram. Wow. He didn't even consult Abram. So much arrogance, so much pride, so much foolishness. He chose for himself. Who's still listening? <laughs> Abram said to him, you choose, you go left, I'll go right. You go right, I'll go left. Wow. Abram was certainly due, in terms of his rank and authority, to have the permission to pick which direction that he should go. And yet, watch this now, he humbled himself, understanding the foolishness of Lot. Also, trusting God that regardless of what choice Lot makes, God was able to make a fertile ground wherever Abram had left. Do you trust God enough that if he got all of the inheritance, that if she got all of the inheritance, that the, that the uh, promotion was given to that person, do you have enough trust in God like Abram? I trust him no matter what decisions the employer has made, that God has a plan for my life. That should make you feel good and not angry and jealous because of the choices of someone else in your life. Gamaliel, the light of Asia, who was instructing Paul, he was before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is like the supreme court of, of the law. And they were angry with the disciples. And he said, now look, if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it's going to fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. I'm here to underline the fact once again that no matter who has passed you by, no matter who didn't give you the promotion, no matter what seemingly has been taken from you, that you serve a God who's bigger than all of the talking heads and all of the puppets, that God can get you wherever he needs to get your life. Can I have a good amen? He saw and he beheld and he chose for himself. Wow. Didn't even ask. Didn't even ask. You got Mr. Christopher over there. You hear his testimony coming out of the pit to the palace. You wouldn't want to find out? How did you get there? How did, how did that happen for your life? How, how did you come out of that? You got so many in here that if we're humble enough, there is enough vital information on how to move from the pit to the prison and to the palace in all areas of one's life. How did that happen? He didn't even, he didn't even ask Abram. The resource is right there. And you didn't even care to ask him. You chose for yourself. You're going to just go do that? You're not going to ask anybody about it. You're going to go run off? You're, gonna, you're not even going to inquire? Lot. Foolish. Watch what happens. Done here. Did I say that already? Where did he pitch his tent? He pitched his tent. Chapter 13, verse 12. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. I close with this. Backsliding. It's slow progression. Sodom, you know what that is. It literally uh, means in the uh, Hebrew, it means to burn, to be scorched. Gomorrah means a ruined heap. And so now we find that Lot lifted up his eyes. God didn't tell him to. He did himself. He saw and he beheld. He began to fantasize what this would be like. He chose for himself. 
didn't even ask. Didn't even care about getting direction from Abram. And then he pitched his tent towards Sodom. You have your Bible? Two scriptures. We close. Genesis 14, verse 12. Tell me you love God's Word. Tell me you love the boring preacher. Genesis 14, 12. Tell me if you have it. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, really nephew. And where was Lot? Now he's dwelling in Sodom. He went from pitching his tent towards Sodom. And now where is he? He's in Sodom. The progression of backsliding. It's so slow. By the time you get into Sodom, you don't even remember how you got there. Breaks my heart a woman in this church. The famine came to her. She knew the principles, but didn't choose to allow them to break her, to humble her, to bring her into a deeper relationship with God. Went through many relationships with men that failed, and now she's with a woman. How do you go from speaking in tongues? How do you go from releasing a preacher-teacher presentation, which was fantastic? How do you go from a vibrant, seemingly life in God, and now over the progression, now you're with a woman and you're having relationships with her? Beloved, don't think it can't happen to you. Let him that thinks he stands... Be careful, he can fall. He went from walking with Abram, chose for himself, lifted up his eyes, got filled with deception. I can still hear the devil. Oh, Debbie Samolin, she'll be nicer than Tina. (laughs) What else? Devil, shut your mouth. I'm hanging up on the devil. I'm going to dig into this thing, and I'm going to see everything that God wants to do for the glory of Jesus Christ. In a few months, we will celebrate 35 years. Come on, that's rocking the box right there. Someone say 35. That's why I got gray hair. (laughs) Wisdom. (laughs) Last scripture. Genesis 19 verse 1. You love God's word? Genesis 19 verse 1. Done right here. Tell me if you see it. I need everybody. Tell me if you see it. And there came two angels to where? At evening time. And where was Lot? Where was he? He was sitting in the gateway. Now, you go back 3,000, 2,000, 4,000 years ago. The gate of the city. That was where your governors, your mayors would come and talk about the condition of the city. Condition of the people condition of what's happening. Now, he went from pitching his tent towards Sodom. Now it progressed. He was living in Sodom. And now we find he's the mayor of Sodom. Backslid all of the way. But there's good news. What's the good news? That God didn't give up on Lot either. And neither did Abram. 
after years passed and my boy Lot got into some trouble, God comes on the scene and says, Abram, you're my friend. Shall I conceal what I'm going to do to my friend? He said, no, I'm going to tell you. And God began the process, as you will see, that he restored and saved Lot and his family and reunited family tensions where it became family peace. Sometimes those you need to separate from wait a few years. Maturity comes. Enlightenment comes, forgiveness comes, humility comes, and now Abram is able to go to Lot, and Lot says, Uncle, I was a mess. Can you get me out of here? And he says, only by the grace of God. Give the Lord a praise, would you? Would you stand to your feet?